America is home to 33 million small businesses, the beating heart of communities across the country. And proof that the American dream is still alive. This is a show about those dreamers and doers and the communities they serve. Their real life stories. Their struggles and successes. Their grit, determination, and passion. And the people who fight to keep their American dream alive. I'm Alfredo Ortiz. I'm Elaine Parker. And it's time for another episode of Main Street Matters. America's small business megaphone. Welcome to another episode of Main Street Matters, America's small business megaphone. I'm Elaine Parker, the president of the Job Creators Network Foundation. And I'm Alfredo Ortiz, CEO of Job Creators Network. And you can subscribe to the show at Salem Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts from. Alfredo, today we're joined by Brian Will. He is a serial entrepreneur and two-time Wall Street Journal bestselling author and a leading consultant in business and sales management. He's currently at the helm of a flourishing chain of restaurants uh, right up in your area, in the Atlanta area, yep. and managing a robust portfolio of residential and commercial real estate across Georgia and Florida. Um, so that should be interesting, um, talking to him about, obviously, the restaurant industry, but also real estate, which are two big um, hot buttons right now, uh, economically and impacting, um, people across the country. Um, but before he comes on, um, uh, the Biden administration, uh, strikes again through the, uh, department of labor, uh, uh, along with the crushing Bidenomics and Biden inflation, um, the department of labor, uh, stepped in with their independent contractor rule that's really going to upend uh, the way America's economy works today. Um, it's a, it is uh, going to destroy our gig economy, which uh, and penalize independent contractors. And I mean, the gig economy has just been fantastic. It's like if you needed to just make a little extra bucks, which you know sometimes my daughter does. She does the. Um, you know, delivering groceries and, you know, she'll just be like, oh, I just need to make some extra gas money today or something. Mm -hmm. And she'll just sign on and do it. So, I mean, that's, that's the gig economy or Uber drivers. Um, give it, tell our audience a little bit more about this independent contractor rule. Yeah. Well, you know, th there you go again, Joe, right. Saying that you're for the little guy. And in the meantime, you're actually screwing the little guy. Um, the independent contractor rule allows so much flexibility excuse me, the, the idea of an independent contractor provides a lot of flexibility to people that maybe are working a full-time job and want to bring in a little extra money, um, like your daughter, um, sounds like, um, or others that are out there driving Ubers, for example, um, want to bring in, you know, 10 hours, you know, 20 hours, whatever they can squeeze in to make ends meet right now, because of course, Bidenomics and inflation is just killing people. Um, but you know, once this independent contractor rule goes through, I mean, the idea of a gig economy is basically gone. Um, and you know, the idea that, you know, I, as an employer would have to bring on these people as employees is just ridiculous. I mean, uh, I'm not sure if you remember uh, Elaine, but I used to build homes, uh, years ago, about a decade ago or so my whole business was independent contractors, right? I mean, I didn't have you know, 50 subcontractors on payroll um, as employees. I mean, I would never be able to survive in that environment. So, you know, you would bring them in as you need. Um, Hollywood, for example, is almost all entirely independent contractors. Um, you know, movie studios don't have all of those people, hundreds of people on payroll. They have independent contractors, right? I mean, it's just the way business has operated for decades and decades and decades. And here goes Joe Biden and his administration and the rest of the Democrats, right, going in and trying to upend something that has been in place and has worked for years. And so, you know, the idea that it takes away that opportunity for, you know, the average worker, the average person to just make a couple extra bucks. I mean, there is just it's an impossibility. I mean, between that. And, you know, the reporting of, you know, PayPal and Venmo and all that of transactions, 600 or dollars or more, which, you know, was put on hold yet again for another year. But they're coming after basically all of these people that are really just independent folks trying to make a living, trying to make an extra buck, um, trying to make ends meet. And it's just going to absolutely upend our economy. And I think it's going to be a disaster for almost every single business that I can think of. Um, because I can't imagine 
you know, having uh, to hire these people on payroll. Well, first, these are small business owners, these independent contractors, and they make their living um, in the case of people in Hollywood, whether it's the hairdressers, the well, makeup artists. Well, the people that hire independent contractors are small business owners. Like I was, I had, you know, a very right. small construction business. But, you know, so it's small business owners, in most cases, hiring small business owners, or it could be a large business hiring small businesses, right? Yeah. And, and what it, what it's going to do is obviously take away the independent contractor's autonomy. Um, cause if you're working for one company, if you're redefined, uh, the definition of an employee is redefined and those companies have to hire you. How do you have multiple clients in that case? Obviously, if you're employed by multiple directly W2 employees, but also it, it, for these small business owners, it becomes um, a, a burden for them because there's additional reporting requirements and costs um, to having a W-2 employee. That's the flexibility and that's the give and take of that relationship for an independent contractor. They are, they're still their own boss and setting their own hours and making themselves available when they are available. But um, like Hollywood, like your uh, home building business, it's project based. You, yeah, you staff right. up when you've got more work and then you can um, not have as many independent contractors working for you and reduce your costs when you don't have as many projects going on. That's the flexibility of it. Um, and so what's the end game here? Um, this is gonna benefit who in the end? Unions, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. I mean, this is a great way to be able to unionize all these independent gig workers and independent contractors, right? force them into unions, force them to pay union dues. Oh, and guess where those unions dues go? About 90% of those go to the Democrat party. I mean, again, this is a party that just is constantly attacking the little guy, constantly attacking middle class. And as much as Joe Biden, the Democrats talk about bottoms up, middle out or something like that, some stupid phrase that they have, they're right. crushing the middle class. They're right. absolutely crushing the middle class. And only the elite of elites and their colleges and the government payrolls, right? I mean, that's what's expanding. And so, you know, Joe Biden's economy is really one that is marked by, you know, plutocrats and, you know, autocrats and folks at the very top that, you know, love power and just don't want to really actually be able to give the little guy a break. Yeah, it, 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 it is a, a, a bigger agenda. You know, I think we talked about this the other day. Um, it is it is a bigger agenda. It's a broader agenda. And it is um, the end game is to benefit those at the top in their party and their party agenda. And it's um, it's tough because it's it ends up being a more populist message um, when, in fact, it's not really helping the little guy. It's hurting them. Um, but the media carries it. Um, you know, the many times ordinary Americans uh, believe it. Um, and I just sometimes I think that the conservative message doesn't shine through as well um, as far as what the what the ultimate benefits of having more freedom, more opportunity to choose, more flexibility to chart your own course, all of those things that we talk about, um, but also that are um our small business owners tell us, you know, those entrepreneur minds. And, um, you know, when you talk to somebody like that and you understand how their mind works and the vision that right. they right. see, they see things differently. They really do. Um, and that's why I think it's so important what we do here on Main Street Matters and in Job Creators Network in in amplifying that story so that people understand the impact that one small business owner, an independent contractor, or a small business owner that employs two people or 20 people can have in their community and on the, the people that they touch. Um, it's amazing. Yeah, it, 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 but it is frustrating, right? Because this narrative that they love spinning, um, you know, Joe, you know, hardworking blue collar guy from Scranton, Pennsylvania, you know, it's just, it, it's just a joke, right? Because, uh, they just don't understand. I mean, they just truly don't understand. I, I mentioned the other day, you know, I went into my grocery store and, you know, I just, just to pick up a bottle of ketchup and it was $9, uh, over $9 for a bottle of ketchup. And I'm not talking fancy ketchup here. Um, I'm talking good old Heinz. And so it's, uh, it's just absolutely nuts. 
the average American just can't 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 stand. So, which I guess it's no surprise why the polls, you know, basically eighty percent of the people think they're worse off than they were a couple of years ago. Yeah, and that has everything to do with the economy and how people are feeling. Um, I read an article. I think it was um, the head. It was head of the U.S. Chamber, basically saying, "Let's be more positive." Um, you know, we're, we're hurting the free enterprise system because we're not being, we don't have a positive message. And I'm like, you know, I think entrepreneurs in general are positive about their own situation, but they're not oblivious to what's happening out there with high costs, high inflation, high gas prices. Their employees are, are hurting and wages aren't keeping up. And uh, the employers can't just keep raising prices on consumers. So just because you say it doesn't make it true. Um, the reality is the reality. Well, that's why I'm actually excited to get Brian on, Brian Will, our, our next guest, because he's actually going to break it down for us. He's going to talk about the reality of what he's been facing mm -hmm. as a restaurant owner and the realities of inflation, the way it's been hitting uh, his restaurants and the, his bottom line. It's actually scary. It does a great job breaking it down. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually very excited to be able to talk to them about this because, you know, these real life examples are what we really have to get out there. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, it went crazy and viral on the internet, right? The $16 happy meal. Um, you know, people, people tell me they can't go in there with, you know, with, uh, you know, out, without spending 30, $40 at McDonald's for, you know, one adult and two kids. Um, it's just, it's just crazy. So I'm excited to hear what he has to say about this. Me too. And and now it is time for our interview with Brian. Um, we're going to talk to him about the $16 BLT sandwich and how Bidenomics got us to this point. Brian, welcome to Main Street Matters, America's small business megaphone. Elaine and Alfredo, I appreciate you having me. This will be a fun interview today. Yeah, absolutely. I saw you this week earlier on Fox. You did a great job breaking down the impact of Bidenomics and Biden inflation, we're all feeling it. Small business owners, the average American worker. Uh, hot news flash just came through. The consumer price index just came out. Core was at almost 4%, 3.9%. So inflation is not over. There's nothing to celebrate. We talk about price levels uh, all the time here. Um, I always like kind of making the analogy, Brian, that's kind of like, you know, a guy's gained 50 pounds, you know, in a year. And now we're celebrating because he's only gaining five pounds a month, um, you know, but he's still, you know, the damage has been done. And so um, you did such a great job talking about really breaking down the impact that you felt. Um, but before we get to that, you have an amazing kind of path to where you got today. Um, and a lot of folks on our uh, listeners are entrepreneurs just like yourself, some serial entrepreneurs, some not so much, but um you know, all of them have had some failures and successes, and I guess you have as well. Just I myself as a small business owner have had failures and successes. Um, I'd love for you to kind of go into your background a little bit more and tell people how you got to where you got to. Gosh, Alfredo, my background is like 35 years of, of failing and succeeding. Started when I was 21 years old. My first company was in landscaping, and uh, it did really well until it didn't, as I like to say. Right. When I was 29, it collapsed and I lost everything. My houses, my cars, literally everything I own, when I went into total meltdown. But, you know, as an entrepreneur, we have this drive just to keep pushing through and you got to go, 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 no matter how bad it is. And so I got out of landscaping, went into insurance. I mean, how I got to insurance is weird, but got into insurance and weirdly enough, two years later, sold that company to a venture capital group because we had developed the very first direct-to-consumer call center. And then did another company and sold it to a venture capital group. And the third company we sold to a private equity group. And then when you sell companies, by the way, people still think you're really smart when really five years ago you were mowing grass. But right. uh, they started doing consulting. And now I'm consulting for Fortune 500 companies and doing sales and sales management consulting and started writing books and bought a restaurant chain and got into the real estate business and owned a bunch of real estate in Florida and Georgia and got into politics, ran for city council and Today I do uh, executive coaching and uh, more like a fractional COO type of role for companies working with the in the five to fifty million range. So it's been an interesting ride. Uh, th that's great. You know, Brian, you mentioned um, you know you were able to sell uh, some of your you know companies four or five times over. You know, different different ideas. 
you know, a lot of folks that are listening to our, our podcast, they're in that situation, right? They have a particular business they've created. They might be interested in something. What is the process of that, that you had to go through? Because you went through it multiple times to kind of identify at what point do you sell? How do you sell it? How do you find the right people? I mean, I'm sure people will be very interested in hearing that. Yeah, it's interesting. And I, I actually had a little course we're developing. My next book coming out is called The Invisible Multimillionaire. And it's about how to prepare your company for an exit to, ge to create generational wealth. And the concept is if you're going to get the highest multiple possible in an exit, you need to actually be the invisible guy at the top. You can't be the, whole, the sole knowledge holder. You can't be the person doing the work. You can't be the person that every customer relies on. Mm. You really have to prepare yourself and your business for somebody else to be able to walk in and take over that business. And you are able to exit without affecting the business long term, right? Nobody wants to buy your business if you're the man and you do everything. It just doesn't work. There's, there's no intrinsic value to that. So if you're looking to sell a company, then you need to start developing the processes, procedures, the internal SOPs, general operating procedures to get yourself out of the day to day so that you have something of value to sell. So that's a long, actually, my next book is going to talk all about it. So it'll be interesting. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, when it does come out, we'd love for uh, you to come back on the show and we'd love to highlight that and make sure our viewers and listeners uh, are know, know how to get that uh, book because that sounds like some great insight. Yeah, that'll be it's uh, I'm doing it with a friend of mine who actually does M&A work selling companies to private equity. I mean, anywhere from 50 to 100 million dollar companies. And so he has this inside track on what private equity is looking for. And I have this inside track on what people who have built businesses and sell them do. So yeah, the two great. of us are kind of collaborating on this idea. I think it's going to be a, a good one. Uh, it's, it sounds fantastic. So definitely interested. Keep us posted. Hey, Brian, thanks for coming on. Um, you, your story is very interesting uh, when I read about your background. And of course, um, success is never a straight line. And I think you are uh, the poster child for that, <laughs> for sure. Um, I love your book titles. I, I looked at some of your books. Um, my favorite one is I Give Dumb Kids Hope. Uh, tell us a little <laughs> bit about that book, please. You know, it's a funny story. I'm the kid who failed out of high school at 16. I managed to get in. I graduated with a 1.2 GPA. That's like a D plus. Got kicked out of the house, had no place to go, joined the military, got out, tried to hold a job, couldn't. So started a landscaping business because I figured anybody could mow grass and dig holes. Now, I'm a big believer in education. Both my kids have advanced degrees, but my kids both went to the Walker School in Marietta, which is a private school. And the Walker School used to give these kids three or four hours of homework every night, which drove me crazy. I think they work these kids too hard. And I'd get in arguments with my daughter all the time about, you got to go to bed, honey. It's midnight. You got to get up at 7 a.m. and go to school. And she'd be like, daddy, I got to study. I got to study. So one night at 2 a.m., I, I get in an argument with her. I'm like, you have got to go to bed. And she said, daddy, you're not supporting my educational goals. I got to get good grades to get into a good college to get a good job. And I said, honey, your grades aren't that important. And mind you, we're living in this 10,000 square foot house. I got a beach house, a lake house, an airplane, cars, boats. I mean, I got everything you could possibly imagine. I'm 40 some years old, don't work. And she said, daddy, you're not supporting me. And I said, well then honey, if grades are so important, how do you explain me? Uh -huh. And she said, you know, daddy, we were talking about you in school the other day. And I said, really, what were you talking about? And she said, we decided you give the dumb kids hope. <laughs> and I started laughing. I'm like, I know that's an insult, but that's literally the type, my life story. That's my autobiography. You don't have to go down the traditional path. You don't have to do what society tells you to do. There is another way you can do it. And it's called persistence and self-education and bombarding your brain with, with, with good information and books and podcasts and association with people. There's other ways to do it other than that. So you know, that was the genesis of that book. And it's about life lessons and how you overcome adversity and trauma and childhood issues and all that kind of stuff to go on to create tremendous success. I, th I think that's yeah. a, a great background story for that book. Um, and it, it is a, a very strong message because right now, today, as we speak, we've got um, kids who, uh, you know, are coming out of college with uh, tens of thousands of dollars in college debt. Um, and they don't have any skills that are marketable to actually get a job. These colleges have sold them a bill of goods that if they buy this degree in, you know, basket weaving or whatever it is, and um, that they'll get a job. 
and they're being drowned out by all this debt. And uh, our organization uh, took the Biden administration to um, court uh, last year, and we won at the district level, and the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the 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 student bailout was was struck down. Um, of course, they're still trying to do a lot of bailouts um, in different ways and go around it. But the gist of it is what you just said. Not everybody has to go to college to be successful. There are other paths, but let's solve the college problem too so we don't have these kids drowning in debt with no skills um, and can't get a job. Ellen, do you, do you know how much a plumber costs? <laughs> I, I own restaurants. I call a plumber. He doesn't walk in the door for less than $300 an hour. I, it's absolutely insane what these people charge. These are these are plumbers and electricians. I don't say anything bad about them. They make a hell of a hell of a lot of money. They didn't go to college, most of them. You know, I always college say, is a good thing. I, I believe in it, but yeah, I always say when I when I come back in my next life, I'm going to be a plumber because they can charge anything <laughs> they want. Yes, um, and you know, to own a plumbing company, I mean, you you have to be a gazillionaire. You know, at that point, when you've got other plumbers working for you, it it is it's. That is the trade to be in, I think, because there is no limit to what you can charge because nobody knows how to fix what they're doing. And I don't want to stick my fingers down that drain. <laughs> That's the main <laughs> thing. <laughs> Things you pull out of there. <laughs> well, um, yeah. so, so, so first of all, Elaine, I won't be insulted that you're making fun of my basket weaving degree, but <laughs> But but so Brian, switching gears back to you know the original purpose of having you on. Um, thank you for sharing your your background. But a sixteen dollar BLT, we got to break that down yep. because you own a few restaurants. One uh, particularly, we're talking about where you sell a BLT and it's now sixteen dollars. Tell us about the sixteen dollar BLT. Yeah, so everything in business, particularly uh, in a in a small type of business, I I liken it to a guy on a tightrope. Right, and the guy on a tightrope, he's walking this little thin line. He's got this bar that goes way out on e either side, and you have to balance as a business owner that on that tightrope what you can charge versus what a consumer is willing to pay. And if one of those gets out of balance, the business goes down. The guy falls off the wire. Right. Yeah. So if we look at sixteen dollars sandwich, here's how it breaks down. You've got about four dollars and fifty cents in rent because rent is expensive where we are. We're in a, we're in a high traffic location. Mm -hmm. You've got about $2 worth of utilities and whatnot. You've got about $2.50 worth of operational expenses. My numbers will be off a little. But you got $4.50 just in labor, right? Labor is incredibly expensive these days. So if you add all these operational costs up, there's only about $2 left of profit in that sandwich that I as an owner get to keep. And I always joke around that and you guys go out to eat, right? How much do you guys tip? 15%, 20%? 20%. Right. My restaurant makes about 12. Right. So when you, when my, when that server brings that plate of food to you, to your table, I make about 12%. They make 15 to 20. They make more money than I do. Yeah. And by the way, I only make 12% if you like it and don't send it back. Right. If you send that plate of food back and it's $16 and I've only got $2 of profit, I got to sell eight more plates of food in order to get my $16 back, I lost on the one you didn't like. Mm -hmm. So the operational expenses are astronomical. You look at labor alone. Our labor has jumped from $500,000 a year to $650,000 a year just in that one restaurant. And by the way, sales went down from two point nine to $2.5 million in that same time frame. So I lose $350,000 in revenue and I, I, I gain $150,000 of payroll. So profits used to be 20 or 25%. Today, they're more like 12 because I, I have to charge enough to make a little bit of money, but I can't charge enough that you're going to stop coming to the restaurant. So right. you're always trying to balance what the customer is willing to pay. And yes, we take a revenue hit because our and our expenses go up and our profit goes down and it gets tougher and tougher to do business. I mean, you guys know, or at least Alfredo, you know, our area, restaurants are failing like crazy around here. Yeah, yeah. At downtown Roswell, downtown Alpharetta, they're going under like crazy. You guys just lost another one that's been a staple in Roswell for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, so, it's un unaffordable for sure. And like you said, on the labor costs. And, 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 you know, it's interesting because folks in the administration and, you know, within the whole Democrat party don't seem to understand that there is a point where people just are going to stop going, right? Um, because they just can't take those prices. I, I visited uh, recently a restaurant in Orlando, Florida, um, and the appetizers, the appetizers were almost $20. 
for an appetizer. I mean, we're not talking a fancy, fancy restaurant at all. I, I, I use this example a lot. I, I love Starbucks. I get the same exact drink every morning. There are three locations around here. One charges seven fifteen, one charges eight thirteen, and one charges nine fourteen for the same drink, depending wow. on the location. Because it depends on the rent you got to pay, the utilities you have to pay, the overhead, the cam charges, all that stuff goes into that cost, and people don't get it. Right. They think, well, you can make a BLT for five dollars. Yeah, you can, but I have to have. I paid a million dollars to build the restaurant. Right. And now I have to pay 20000 a month in rent. Right. So I still have to cover those costs in order for me to be in business. So oh. it's uh, it's and crazy. There's, and there's something that's called return on your capital. As an yes. entrepreneur, you also <laughs> have to make a return on your capital, right? Because right now you can just stick your money in a bank and you're making, you know, five and a half percent. Yeah. Uh, it, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> yep. You're, it's 100, you're 100 percent right. It's uh, business is getting tougher and tougher. And, and yeah, they don't really understand. I love people in Congress who say, those terrible restaurant owners are only paying their servers two dollars and thirteen cents an hour. My servers make thirty dollars an hour. Yeah, there's no two dollars an hour anywhere. It just doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. In fact, you know, um, in in Florida and in California, I mean, you know, New York. You know, when I talk to waiters about some of these minimum wages that they're trying to, you know, basically they get rid of tip wages and stuff like that. They're like, I hope these guys would just stop like meddling with their business that they don't even know what they're doing here's uh, the thing steve Ducey asked me this question he said what if you just paid your people instead of doing tips i said well i'd probably have to pay them maybe 15 dollars an hour right but right now they're making 30. do you think they want to take a pay cut right if we stop the tip system most servers and bartenders would make a lot less money yeah. they're not the ones pushing for this no they say they actually say you know i, I love it i remember reading that there, there one was close like these hollywood people just have to stop, you know, like they have to mind their own business, right. do yes. movies, leave us servers and restaurant folks alone because we're actually doing just fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I try to promote people in my, my servers, my bartenders into management. They don't want it. They're like, why would we want to make less money for all the extra responsibility? We love right. our job. Right. You know? it, it cracks me up. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Th you know, as a, as a restaurant owner and, you know, you've talked about it and we saw inflation come out. Um, this morning, it's of course rising again. Um, there's only so much you can raise prices. Is mm -hmm. from your from your vantage point, what is the solution? How do how, I mean, Alfredo and I know what what we think should be done, but what do you think should be done? You're really on the front lines. You know, somebody asked me this question yesterday, and I said the challenge with with what's going on right now is nobody knows what's going to happen in the next election. Right? We don't know what's going to happen. If one party gets elected, it's going to get worse. And they said, and they, they said, well, what happens if, let's see, what happens if the, the, the Trump gets reelected? If he, if Glenn Beck says, if he doesn't go to jail and if he doesn't get in trouble and if he doesn't do this, he doesn't, what? And I said, here's the thing. The economy will eventually catch up to where we are because, it, you know, prices will go up, wages will go up. The economy will eventually catch up to us. But right now they're pushing our expenses so far ahead of what the economy can catch up to. Right. It's putting everything in jeopardy. If we can just stop. Stop the regulation, stop the nonsense, stop the inflation, stop all this giveaway. If we can stop it, and I don't have to continue raising prices to the point where we go out of business, if we can just slow it down and stop it, right. the economy will eventually catch up and it will make sense right. again and people right. will go back out and they'll think they have money to spend. And, you know, my sales are down 15% over the last three years. That will catch up unless this government keeps just piling on with all this nonsense. Uh, that they're doing. So we got to get, we got to just stop. We got we to stop printing money, stop giving it away, stop doing all this stupid stuff, stop right. causing inflation. And, and it'll be okay. Eventually I'm not a doomsday guy, but if they don't, then we're going to, we're in for, we're in for a little world of hurt for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, before we go, what advice do you have for other small business owners, restaurant owners who are struggling right now? The, the key to all business is you better know your numbers. This is, I'm telling you, this is the baseline key. Everything you do in your business should be based on percentages, percentages on your core metrics, right? What's your labor cost? What's your food cost in the restaurant? Labor cost, food cost, liquor cost, rent over revenue. If you can identify the core metrics and you can manage your percentages to a T, then your business will probably be okay. Hmm. You guys would be shocked at how many businesses don't understand what a profit and loss statement looks like. They don't understand how to manage core metrics. They don't understand how to manage their cost and trend lines. 
this is what I do in my consulting practice, by the way. They don't understand how to look at a profit and loss statement and see what happened, why it happened, and what's about to happen to them in the future. So if you're not good at numbers and if you don't know how to run a profit and loss statement, you need to bring in somebody who does, a CPA, accountant, a consultant, a coach, somebody. Because if you can just manage those numbers, you're going to be okay. But if you're not managing them, then you're going to get slaughtered uh, and you're not even going to see it coming. So, Brian, what's the best way that folks can uh, get a hold of you? I have a website. It's brianwillmedia.com. Um, and it's got my books, my podcasts, my training programs, my Great. blogs, my newsletters. brianwillmedia.com. Everything's on there. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, Brian, thanks so much for taking the time to join us on Main Street Matters, America's small business megaphone. And thank you all for taking the time to listen. Main Street Matters is part of the Salem Podcast Network and new episodes debut every Wednesday and Friday. Please subscribe to the show at SalemPodcastNetwork.com and we'll see you next time.